بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم جميعا مساء الخير um, our step today is a step in anesthesia pediatric anesthesia مع استاذ دكتور سعد مهدي chairman والف مبروك of anesthesia department university hospital limerick ireland تفضل حضرتك Uh, Dr. Randa, thank you very much for inviting me to talk uh, before this uh, prestigious and uh, very uh, hard work uh, pediatric uh, course. Uh, I know you for, for a while and I know you are interested in educational event and uh, improving um, the, um, uh, the educational career. Uh, Uh, it is great honor for me to be here today speaking before you and uh, today uh, it is a milestone for my career. I uh, am promoted to be the chair of the department uh, of the anesthesia in Limerick. I'm working in Limerick uh, for the last uh, 10 years as a consultant uh, anesthesiologist. I have developed a lot of the issues uh, like a very operative assessment clinic and uh, a lot of stuff to go and education courses teaching exams uh, i am member of the uh, of the college of the anesthetists uh, in, in ireland and now they call it the college of the anesthesiologists in ireland and i'm examiner as well in the college uh, uh, however it is a great honor for me to be uh, between my colleagues and uh, my friend from other specialty like pediatric Uh, Dr. Randa, just to give me a, a choice to take my uh, lecture, and it came to me um, why pediatric anesthesia is different from other anesthesia. Uh, actually, I put this slide uh, 20 minutes ago. I had a case, nine month old, uh, 8.5 kg. She was scheduled for examination under anesthesia. Uh, for eye refraction. The surgeon was, was rushing because he wants to, uh, to do it uh, in between cataract cases or major cases and just claiming that it will take only five minutes. Uh, however, uh, a child, uh, five minutes, you know already uh, why the children are very important. And any issue when, for example, the, the crash happened in the aeroplane, they tell you that between uh, 245 uh, uh, victims, there is five children. So the children are extremely important and priority for everything. However, the case takes five minutes, but for anesthesia is nothing like five minutes, simple anesthesia, even sedation, it takes a lot of priority. So we have to do preparation and to have to anticipate and prepare very well for what's going to happen or might happen. Uh, the patient developed laryngospasm uh, after induction, before even the laryngeal mask to put the laryngeal mask. And thank God we treated that very carefully. Uh, uh, after they finished the procedure, uh, the patient developed laryngospasm after excavation and we treated that. Uh, examination under anesthesia only took five minutes exactly, but saturation dropped to 65%. And all of you, you know how serious when the saturation drops to 65%, and we talk about that later on. Uh, it is a very basic lecture uh, why pediatric anesthesia is different from the adult. Basically, pediatric anesthesia was uh, solo or was under the umbrella of pediatric or Amer American Academy of Pediatric till uh, 1966 and they joined the branch of anesthesiology in uh, 1973. It was like a small chapter in the pediatric, uh, any pediatric book. But later on in UK system, A pediatric Anesthesia Society developed in 1986. So it is something came recently and it took our intention to, uh, to give it interest. And there is a claim uh, 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 for emergency codes has been open and, uh, in America and they found most of the claim are due to respiratory origin. 80% of the cardio pulmonary arrest in pediatric uh, for that claim are due to respiratory distress. Uh, 
In the closed claim between 1990, uh, uh, that closed in 1990 and carried out by AC, American Society of Anesthesiology, they found that respiratory event was a largest class of injury, more common in the children than adults. Uh, 19 to 92% of the claim were required between 75 and 85, so almost 10 years before the continuous pulse oximetry and advanced monitoring or standard monitoring to be as a, a criteria. With continuous uh, oxygen saturation and the carbon dioxide monitoring, uh, they found all of this incident dropped. Uh, uh, after 1990, because the first pulse oximetry came to Alexandria University Hospital was in 1994. Before that, you don't find any monitor except the ECG and uh, the non-invasive blood pressure, which is now uh, replaced by the automated blood pressure. Just to press the button and the machine will check the blood pressure for you. We, I started in the era when I was an anesthetist during night time, I ventilate the patient with my hand all the night. When I need to check the blood pressure, I go with the, the uh, uh, signal monitor to check the blood pressure, uh, is the mercury one, and every 15 minutes. So I was uh, replacing somebody or the nurse to ventilate the patient with hand, and I go to check the blood pressure. My hand was on the pulse all the time, but now, Thank you, God, we're replaced by standard monitoring and the very high tech. That's why when I talked to my junior and nieces, I told them that uh, you live in the Rolls Royce uh, era. Uh, why the pediatric anesthesiologist uh, uh, should know more? Uh, he should know exactly what you know about the basic stuff of the pediatric patient, like the pediatrician. He should know about more about the airway and the respiratory system. He should know a stage of dentition, and we know that a little bit uh, in short, in very short while. And he should know about cardiovascular system in full detail, renal system in full detail, hepatic system, glucose metabolism, hematology, temperature control, central nervous system. He should know everything you know. But we don't write, uh, for example, antibiotic for whatever. Uh, we, we see the patient in a snapshot, and during this snapshot, we should know everything about the patient from head to torso, from basic to pathology, from everything about the patient. Uh, that's only, you see that we see the patient for the five minutes only, or 10 minutes, or one hour for the anesthesia, and we should know everything about the patient. So, any pediatric anesthesiologist should know about all of these basic stuff. And we spend ages to know those neonatal or definition. Neonates or newborn is a human offspring between zero and 28 days. And why is it very important to know that? Because we have, for example, the ambulance, and uh, we had one child who was a uh, preterm and now is almost um, uh, six weeks and uh, his weight is to I think uh, his weight around uh, five or three four it was around four kg and we would like to transfer this patient to another hospital and the responsible is neonatal ambulance and the neonatal ambulance says that how old is the patient the child is a, the child is six weeks and they know he's not a neonate anymore because the neonatal age is 28 days and it was been the dilemma we couldn't uh, transfer this patient to the proper uh, transfer so we should be aware about those uh, classification, like the toddler, which is a child between one to one year and three years, preschool between three to five, school age between six to 12, and we know the adolescent. And again, why the anesthesia for children is different. Because if you look at the child, you find the head is taking more than 30% of the body. Uh, large oxygen, uh, thin hollow underdeveloped, in the cheek and the mandible, a flowy omega uh, uh, shaped epiglottis will go through those issues in full detail. Uh, the subglottic is narrow, high larynx, large tongue, and uh, narrow uh, uh, nasal nerves. We should be aware, fully aware, fully aware, no excuse 
for the anesthesiologist who doesn't know about the basic and the advanced physiology and the anatomy of the respiratory system and the airway for the infant should have a lot, the infant have a large head relative to the torso. The tongue is relatively large and contribute to the major airway obstruction during anesthesia. Basically, because the tongue muscles are very floppy and fall backward to occlude the, uh, the larynx. Uh, the larynx is high up and anterior at the level of C3 to C4. In adult, it is between C4 and 5 or 5 and 6. The epiglottis is long and floppy, longer, stiff, and U-shaped. Why like that? You know, what is the effect of that? It clubs posteriorly and occlude the larynx, result in hypoxemia and the difficult to ventilate the patient. The trachea is short and uh, the right main bronchus is less angulated than the left bronchus. And what is the effect of that? Because the tube, uh, a tube, it, when it goes into the trachea and you fix the tube around 12 centimeter and uh, 4 centimeter are in the mouth and uh, 8 centimeter in the, in the trachea, you know, if one centimeter far in, the tube goes to the right and the far out, it goes out of the vocal cord. So you have to be in high alert about the intubation of the child. Neonates and infants preferentially breathe through their noses. And you know that very well as a pediatrician, and thank you very much for that. But the problem, as long as we are in recovery, those patients, if they have some secretion, they are easily obstructed and resulted in hypoxemia. The airway is the narrowest at the level of the coracoid in adults. But in children, they are a a subglottic stenosis or a, 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 a cricoid a cartilage. That's why when you pass the, the tube from the, uh, from the vocal cord, it doesn't mean that you are able to pass the, the tube uh, through that. So uh, the cricoid is the narrowest point in the, in, in the children. Sorry, I, I said the adult before, but the cricoid is the narrowest point in the children, not the vocal cord. In adult, the narrowest point of the airway is the vocal cord. If you pass the tube from the glottis, it will be passed through the trachea. But for the children, you expect a lot of subglottic stenosis. Although there is ongoing debate about this true or not, but usually we see that a lot in our experience. Why is this important? Why we calculate the tube, and we'll talk about that later on, but usually we prepare one tube larger and one tube smaller than expected, and we test the tube, if there is leak around the tube, we leave it. If we massive leak, we change the bigger size, or if the tube is, is smaller, we, uh, we, uh, or the, if the tube is tight, we take a smaller tube. Uh, as we mentioned before, the children are nasal breathers. Again, in the airway, infants have a higher respiratory rate, low functional capacity, uh, result in very rapid hypoxemia and increase the work of breathing. So neonates and infants are fatigued faster. Uh, Post-operative apnea after anesthesia is very common, particularly in premature infant, particularly if the patient has morphine intraoperatively. Infants have a higher oxygen consumption. Yes, six mL per kg per minute. We know that. And because they are high metabolic rate, uh, the minute ventilation is more dependent on respiratory rate rather than tidal volume. They are fast breathing. So physiological adaptation in, uh, is not well developed in younger age group. And the abdominal muscle uh, strength are underdeveloped. They can't have the six bags as the boys do it in school age. A sniffing position in adult to, to make it, to make the ventilation easier, which is not helping a lot in pediatric because the epiglottis is uh, long, floppy, and it can drop, including the larynx. Again, in the respiratory system, the ribs and the cartilage are more pliable, very soft. So when the patient takes breathing, the ribs and the cartilage goes down. It just wall collapse very easy 
and with increased negative enterocolitic pressure. That's what exactly happened today with a nine month old child. Control of respiration is very poor and because the whole neurological system are under, is underdeveloped. Uh, prolonged apnea is common after anesthesia. Hypoxemia in adult uh, improve breathing, but for children uh, makes uh, uh, breathing inhibited. And that very schematic uh, shape for the uh, difference between the thyroid and adult, uh, the, the airway in adult and uh, an infant. And we see here the cricoid cartilage is uh, very narrow in relative to the uh, adult system. And uh, we explained that already. So you see that on the uh, right side, there is a, a, a airway of the uh, adult and the left side, that the airway of the children. And you see the epiglottis is floppy and long. And you see the uh, opening here is very, very narrow. And you see that eventually that adult, the size of the tube here, we'll talk about the size of the tube later on. And, but you see the difference, this one easy intubation, this one is difficult intubation. Again, the narrowest weight is the cricoid uh, uh, cartilage, uh, not the vocal cord. Tube may be small enough to pass through the cord, but not the cricoid cartilage. Uh, the larynx is the funnel shape, and so secretion accumulates in the retropharyngeal space. Uh, why should we aware about the dentition? Somebody say that why the anesthetist should know that. It's very important to know about this because sometimes the children coming very happy. I have a loose tooth here, and with intubation or airway devices, this loose tooth can go down or can be uh, taken out and dropped in the mouth or in the airway. So you made a problem for the airway obstruction. So you have to know when those teeth uh, are growing and when they are taken off, not to make any problem. Again, the cardiovascular system is very important. And when you go to the physiology and pharmacology in anesthesia, you find that the respiratory system, cardiovascular system, renal system are taking more than 75% of the uh, physiology. We all know that the cardiac output equal the heart rate to stroke volume. I didn't see anything new with that. But the myocardium in the children are less contractile, stiffer, in the units causing the ventricle to be less compliant and less able to generate tension during contraction. This limits the size of the stroke volume and the cardiac output is only rate dependent. So if you expect that for adult, if the patient is hypotensive, you give 500 mL fluid or 250 mL fluid, you cannot give that in the children because you are calculating the fluid or whatever according to the body weight. Uh, the other reason for the cardiovascular system or difference, the sympathetic nervous system is not well developed. So the patient has a very good vagus, but they don't have a very good sympathetic nervous system. So that's why the patient is liable for bradycardia more than tachycardia. Uh, uh, bradycardia reduced in a redu result in reduced cardiac output. Vasopressor in pediatric are not the first option to increase the blood pressure. So what is the first option? Is to increase the heart rate and decrease the stroke volume. Uh, another issue, I believe you know that more than myself, in the beta ductus arteriosus, it can stay, uh, can reopen again uh, within the next five years uh, because the pulmonary vasculature reacts so the rise of the BO2 and the BH and following the BCO2 at birth, that's why it closed. However, if any change of those during the five years, it can be open again. So you have to be aware about that. Yeah. When you see a child with heart rate of 120, don't panic because that's normal for them. The blood pressure is not hypotensive around 90 or so, that's normal blood pressure. But for the mean arterial blood pressure is around 85 to 105. So that's, that's the normal figures. But while if you go down to an age, if you go up to age of 16, and you'll find the heart rate is around 80 or even 50, if they are athletic, that's completely normal. This is the same child who was 
when he wa when he or she was a newborn around 120. That is corresponding to the age. That's normal parameter. What about the renal system? Renal system, renal blood flow and the glomerular filtration rate is low in the first two years of life due to high renal vascular resistance. They have lower tubular concentration ability, which result in a higher obligatory fluid loss. About the hepatic system, I know you know those issues, but I'm explaining to you here as an ESIS, the role of the anesthesiologist, why he should know all of that. Because if the renal system, I will go back to the renal system, is not fully elucidated. So if you give the patient, the adult patient, one liter of fluid, no harm because the patient kidney is able to execute the extra amount of fluid. But if you give the child other little bit more fluid than usual, the child will result in congestion because the renal system is not fully developed. About the liver, the liver is initially immature with decreased function of the hepatic enzyme. So barbiturate and opioid, for example, have a longer duration uh, of uh, action due to slower metabolism. So morphine is not innocent in the children. And if you give any uh, hypnotic or any uh, sedative or any opioid, you have to be very careful because the brain blood brain barrier is not well developed. The brain sensitivity to those opioids is very high and the, the metabolic um, excretion is not well developed. About the glucose metabolism, it's very, very important. And we have a case report in Northern Ireland. I will talk to you about that in, in one second. A hypoglycemia is common in stress units and the glucose level should be monitored regularly. Glucagon stores are located in the liver and the myocardium. Uh, neurological damage may result from hypoglycemia. We all know that. And the hyperglycemia is usually iatrogenic. Uh, why glucose is very important. Uh, in, in, in Northern Ireland, there was a child who was in, in the war, and uh, some doctor wrote to him glucose 5% and uh, 20, 20 mil or whatever amount of fluid given per hour. And the next doctor came, he continued the same medication like what we do every day. And the patient to start to take glucose. Uh, with no electrolytes for, I think, uh, one or two days, resulted in brain edema, and the patient died. So now in UK, and in our system, if you give the children fluids, you have to monitor the electrolyte every six hours, uh, at least. If it is stable, might go to 12 hours. But if the patient is in IV fluids continuously, you have to monitor the uh, fluid uh, electrolyte, especially uh, sodium and the potassium. So hematology, when the patient, uh, when the child is delivered, the hemoglobin is around 19.3. Oh my God. And uh, around less than one month, hemoglobin is 16.6. .6. And later on, after six months, it's 12.5. So that is the hemoglobin, you know, because this one is very important. And that is the hemoglobin, fetal hemoglobin dropped by age in month. So after six months, the amount of the fetal hemoglobin is very low. Why is this very important? Because the fetal hemoglobin has a very good um, uh, affinity to, uh, to the auction and uh, 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 binds to the auction very well. Uh, so it does not offload the auction at the tissue level. Uh, temperature and regulation is extremely important in pediatric anesthesia and especially in the Western society because the temperature is very cold even in summertime uh, we have a very low temperature in theater I know you say that is very abnormal point uh, to talk about that especially in the Middle East uh, the temperature is roasting but in theater usually we have a uh, air condition or whatever so the operating room is uh, very cool why should we know about the regulation temperature regulation in the children babies and infants sorry babies and infants have large surface area to the weight ratio with minimal subcutaneous fat, no shivering till one year old. It is normal, normal reactivity or normal reaction to the um, 
temperature, low temperature, we shiver, we increase the metabolism, we increase the heat gain in the body. They have poorly developed shivering. They don't shiver very well. They can't sweat properly. They can't have vasoconstrictions. They're always vasodilated. Due to this reason, the heat loss is exaggerated during general anesthetic. Infant and the children may lose up to three degrees centigrade during the first hour of anesthesia. That's why if you go to the operating room, if a child coming, we have a, a heating mattress uh, on the table. We have a, a bear hugger like a blanket, a hot blanket, and all fluid are warm fluid. That's why active measures should be taken to prevent hypothermia, especially iatrogenic hypothermia. We have forced air uh, blanket above the patient to technique the, to actively um, heat the, the operating room. Uh, we adjust the temperature of the theater as well and uh, to uh, minimize the heat loss and warm the fluid to the patient. Uh, central nervous system is very important in many reasons. Number one, the blood-brain barrier is underdeveloped and the patient is very sensitive to uh, opioid and sedative. So about 150 articles have been published uh, using animal model from rodent to primate, all kinds of anesthetic with exception perhaps xenon are, and to some extent dexamethidine have been implicated in neurotoxicity. Neuromuscular junction itself is immature. So when you give the muscle relaxant, you, are, you have to be very cautious. So this point is very, very important in children. You find the child coming with his mom and his dad, and they are, they have the fear. The child doesn't have fear much. He doesn't know what's going to happen to him, especially in young children. And the child, the child, dad and the mom are absolutely apprehensive. So you have to talk to them very uh, cautiously. You have to be nice to them. You have to be empathetic to them. You have to be very professional to alleviate their anxiety. You have to be sure that you, 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 you give them the message you want to do. Especially the the are the children are upset from separation from their parent, and the parents themselves, themselves are upset to see their children weak or sleep or whatever. And a lot of time you find them crying in the operating room, loading your stress. But you have to be calm enough. Older children and infants up to school age get very upset and distressed by separation from their parent and exposure to unfamiliar uh, environments like people in theater and uh, wearing different clothes, different environment. Uh, it is a challenge to rationalize uh, with the children at this age. Uh, older children and adolescents can get very apprehensive about surgical procedure, especially they are anticipating pain or unknown uh, environment going to happen to them. Uh, older children are very concerned about loss of control, about loss of consciousness. They are talking uh, loudly about their experience, uh, uh, subconscious. All of these are very important. And on top of that, you have to be very professional with the parent and relative. Um, sorry, I have to go back to the slide again. Uh, when you talk to the child, you have to be dealing with the child. You give him the respect. Even you have, uh, what, that's what I do myself. I go down to the level of the child. I talk to him. I respect the child. I, I ask him to listen to me and he listen and to concentrate very well. Even after two years, the child is very, very good and to, is, is like, the, the child likes to give him attention. That's, that's his right to give him attention and they understand. And they, when you go going to move from the child to the parent, I usually ask permission from the child. I would like to talk to your dad and your mom. Uh, do you have any objection? The child he says, yes, I am I'm fine with that. Go ahead, give him the respect ask the child uh, permission, that give him identity, give him um, uh, control about his environment. He will give you the trust and uh, uh, lose his fear about the environment. Uh, you know, professionalism, even with the children, are very important. So 
we finish the basic stuff about the physiology and the psychology, we can talk about the pharmacology. <clears throat> and uh, yes, the, the pharmacology in the children is quite different from adults. During the first several months after birth, rapid development and the growth of the organ system take place, altering the factors involved in uptake, distribution, tabulate, elimination of the anesthetic and the other related drugs. So pharmacokinetic and the pharmacodynamic are quite different in children. The extent of the difference among infants and the children and adults in response to the administration of drugs is not just the size of the conversion. The child is not a small adult. He is he's a small in everything. So physiology, anatomy, pharmacology, everything is different. So the hepatic biotransformation is immature, as we mentioned in physiology, the hepatic enzymes are underdeveloped. The protein binding to the, to the drugs is quite different. Muscle mass is different. It's, it, fat a store is different. Glucose is different. Everything is different in children. It's just not, if you get a child 20 kg, and they give you, sorry, if you get a child or, or age 40 kg, and they, you might find another adult or 50 kg, they are not close to each other. <coughs> so the child is going to have a surgery uh, shortly. What are you going to do for that? Um, you need to go down to assist the child if there is any illness uh, and severity, uh, pre-operative assessment. Uh, you find any problem uh, early to detect it. Uh, you would like to optimize the patient quite early. And all of this, why you do all of that? You need to improve the outcome, okay? And I told you I was involved in the development of the pre-operative assessment clinic in, in my hospital. So you wanted to do very overall evaluation for the children, like exactly the adult. We do that for the adult, and we don't have children, a big, big section of the children. We, uh, we, we try to do that for the children as well. Uh, the upper is the retrotract infection, but it is both to coughing, laryngus bath, bronchus bath, desaturation during anesthesia. Uh, they come to you, the child has a mild cough, yeah, it's mild cough, but this mild cough for me under anesthesia is a major factor. A snoring and noisy breathing due to adenoid or tonsillar hypertrophy lead to airway obstruction. Chronic cough due to subglottic stenosis or previous <coughs> uh, tracheoesophageal uh, fistula repair is very important. Uh, check if the child has productive cough, might be bronchitis or pneumonia. Uh, sudden onset cough, like uh, foreign body or aspiration, and we talk about um, loose teeth, and uh, you know those days, <coughs> sorry, the children play with electronics a lot. If the patient has a stridor due to macroglossia or laryngeal wave or uh, laryngeal malaria, if the patient has hoarsened voice due to laryngitis or vocal cord palsy or babyledema. Uh, check if the patient has asthma, how controlled, uh, if he's a bronchodilator, uh, did he have any previous hospital admission? Why like that question? Because it shows you that the asthma is severe, and uh, if the patient has bronchodilator, did he have his bronchodilator today? And we need to give it just before coming to the uh, theater. Uh, does the patient had repeated pneumonia? Might be due to immune deficiency. Um, uh, history of uh, foreign body aspiration uh, is very important, not only for the respiratory system, but it gives you indication that the child is, uh, is a child for special need or underdeveloped uh, cerebral uh, or neuro system. Uh, very good to know the record of the patient. Uh, that the patient has previous anesthesia, and is, if it is anesthetic in the same hospital, you might go to check the uh, chart of the anesthetic. If there is any uh, problem happened before, you might be aware about that. And as well, you, you, we, when we, re, we report the uh, anesthetic record, we write that in full detail because as well, it is a medical legal issue. So we write the size of the cannula, 
the way the patient induced uh, is inhalational induction or IV induction. Uh, the size of the intracranial tube, the size of the mask we use, uh, amount of the fluid, um, uh, uh, antibiotics, if the patient is allergic to anything like that, all of these are extremely important. If the patient has congenital syndrome or congenital heart disease, is any environmental issue or immunization and the vaccination are very important for us to know. So it, despite we said all of that, we don't recommend or we do not uh, ask for routine investigation for children because by virtue, they are normal. And uh, we, we don't ask for anything unless there is any indication for that. Uh, very important to keep your children fasting and to know the protocol of fasting. Six hours for solid food, and four hours for semi-solid like formula milk, two hours for clear water. There is increase in nausea and vomiting in, in increased fasting. It is not good to keep the child fasting for 12 hours from uh, nine o'clock in the evening and the patient will have uh, surgery by lunchtime next morning, it, it will be uh, another higher instance of nausea and vomiting for those children, and the child will be dehydrated, of course. The child, of course, is anxious, and his family is anxious because he's crying, <coughs> he's hungry, thirsty, and uh, <coughs> sorry for that. And uh, you, they need something to uh, relax the child. So sometimes we go for that, but sometimes we don't because sedation. <coughs> My apology. Sedation may be uh, for hyperactive children, may delay the recovery uh, and delay the discharge from the hospital. But uh, uh, another really medication, which is very good, like Emdacrim to minimize the pain for the cannula. Sometimes you give them chlorohydrate, 50 milligram per kilogram body weight. Sometimes you give them ketamine or colonidine or narcotic if required. So ketamine is very important and is very safe in the children, especially in rural area. It is uh, oral, I never give it oral, but it is recorded to be given oral, six to 10 milligram per kg. And the uh, IM muscular, between three to four milligram per kilogram and IV to two milligram per kilogram body weight, but is not as um, brain medication. That is for induction doses. Uh, sorry, those uh, ketamine here is induction, uh, not uh, um, not as um, not as uh, brain medication. But the most common one for brain medication is midazolam, 0.5 milligram per kilogram oral and ask the, the, the mom or the dad to put it or the nurse to put it in uh, orange juice uh, or even clear water and the child can swallow. Sometime before the patient coming to the operating room, I give them some fentanyl, uh, nasal fentanyl, uh, uh, one microgram per kilogram of the weight because the nasal mucosa is a very good surface for absorption and the, uh, the children got very good sedation with the nasal uh, fentanyl. Now, the patient is coming for the operation, basically, for example, to select me, which way should we use? Um, we did the perioperative visit. We come to check the equipment in the operating room. We check our drugs, prepare our drugs, prepare the anesthesia checklist and the surgery checklist, and we concentrate about the most operative routine stuff. So pediatric operating room setup is one of the highest tension in the operating theater. We get the pediatric emergency thoroughly checked. Every morning, we get the pediatric thoroughly checked and uh, warm the operating room for the children, as we mentioned before, especially if the preterm or neonate, uh, warming light or active heating. Uh, we repair the operating table. We usually, we have the mattress, which is warm enough, uh, warming blanket, forced air, pediatric warm mattress, pediatric shoulder roll, uh, head, every single stuff we check by two people to be sure that everything is prepared before the uh, uh, child comes to the operating room. We don't forget that to turn the monitor to pediatric mode, uh, if or you need accordingly to the child coming. 
Sit up the diastatic monitor, ECG, blood pressure, blood sucrimetry are usual. If the patient needs arterial line or central line, we usually insert them accordingly. Uh, we know the blood sucrimeter, uh, the all uh, um, uh, claim or respiratory distress came down because the blood sucrimeter is in action. And enter the monitor and the ventilator, enter the uh, right weight and, uh, and the age for the uh, working station. Prepare the pediatric uh, uh, appropriate breathing circuit uh, accordingly. Uh, we, the patient about coming to the operating room, I go back to ask, uh, to discuss uh, with the dad and the mom about the anesthesia induction and even with the child himself. I give him a sample for the breathing circuit. I will show it to him <clears throat> in two seconds. And they tell him that you will have the mask if the patient is going to have inhalation induction. Sometimes we keep their toys with them to feel uh, very safe. <coughs> I'm sorry. I adopted that from one of the hospital. Uh, that's the checklist we go through and the ventilator is functioning, face mask is available, oxygen supply is available. All the checklist is, should be done before the child come to the operating room and the sign. Another emergency drugs prepare and the monitor and the emergency equipment are available. Different range of pediatric and static equipment, monitor devices and disposable items should be available. Airway management equipment like face mask, tracheal tube, laser mask, oral airway, different sizes should be available. Birth centimeter with pediatric probe, uh, should be available, air, uh, anti carbon dioxide monitoring, ECG, pediatric blood pressure, all of them are coming small, 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 small to match the uh, children uh, age and size. Uh, cannula for the children sometimes go between 25, 24, 22, and here when we go increase the number, decrease the uh, diameter. So usually 22 or 24 are very small and they can suitable can be suitable for a child. If the operation goes beyond 30 minutes or we have to measure the temperature and all substation drugs and equipment, including defibrillator should be available around the operating room. An aesthetic machine uh, incorporate ventilator uh, that permit use of the pressure control ventilation and the weep for the size of the children should be checked and uh, signed. So factor affecting, are we doing good with the time now? Uh, factor influencing the choice of the anesthetic technique. How old the child? Does the child understand the uh, cannula, the, can he tolerate the, the pain for the cannula? Uh, did we put amla cream on the hand? Uh, or are we going to go for the mask uh, induction? What is the underlying illness? Does the patient have any congenital anomaly, any respiratory problem, any cerebral uh, palsy, any special need? Is the child cooperative? Does the child has, uh, have autism? Uh, is the child hyperactive? Some stage like that, we, we have to give the children brain medication, as we mentioned before. Uh, will the parent uh, uh, be available around the child? Uh, does the patient have an IV cannula or not? And uh, uh, what are the skills of the anesthesiologist? So basically, in this situation, we need more than one hand to help. Uh, myself, when I'm, I am in my theater and I have a um, young doctor with me, I have this performer for every single child in the list, in my list, I do that. I ask him to put the age and weight, what cannula you are going to use, uh, what is IV fluid, not IVF like um, uh, um, a children uh, reproduction, it is IV fluids, uh, laryngeal mask sizes, uh, what is the endotracheal tube, how much paracetamol will you give to that a child? and the blood loss expected for that operation. Uh, the date of birth of the child, uh, the uh, weight as we mentioned, uh, how much fentanyl uh, will you give to this child? Uh, if you give morphine, how much morphine? Atropine, how much atropine? Uh, Bromophol, uh, sodium thiobentone, and travel, how much muscle relaxant will you give to the child? 
it's very funny because uh, we know that Robin dose, for example, is 15 microgram per kilogram body weight. We, in the operating room, we get the atropine diluted uh, to 100 microgram per mil, or whatever you want to do, but I usually do it 100 microgram per mil. And when I ask my young colleague, uh, how much, if the patient goes to bradycardia, how much atropine will you give him? Usually here is reply is very clever. 15 microgram per kilogram body weight or 20 microgram per kilogram body weight. No, it's not the answer like that. You're, you prepare that to be in the syringe and you put it to standby. If the patient, if this child, if this child has bradycardia or any insulin, you need to give him atropine. How much volume of this syringe will you give him? 150 microgram, it means that 1.5 mil. Uh, 300 microgram, it means that 3 mil. So you, under, you should understand what should I give for that child with me. He is the only child I have today. Every child in the operating room is the only child I have every day. So even I have 10 children in the list, every child of them, I deal with him as he's the only child I have in the operating room. Again, that is a, a, a performer from uh, Michutis. Uh, sorry for that. And they, they usually go take pediatric car, uh, warm the operating room, repair the OR table, uh, change the monitor, set up the pediatric monitor, <coughs> all what we said before, and uh, we, we uh, they do it. Uh, repair the pediatric IV set. Usually I have duret. And you know, I use it all the time, and it is filling in 100 ml fluid to avoid any uh, overloading the children. So we're coming to be serious a little bit more. We uh, we have seen the child in the outside or in the in the ward. We talk to the mom and talk to the dad and talk to the child himself about uh, induction of anesthesia and uh, we talk to them about uh, what's going to go. If the, if the child needs blood transfusion, we ask them permission we, and consent and we talk to them about the induction of anesthesia and we talk to them about the pain management and even you will be surprised uh, here in my hostel if we give the, if we plan to give the child uh, like paracetamol and diclofenac, PR, uh, I have to ask the consent and I have to write that in the chart that I asked them a consent for a uh, bare rectal uh, 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 medication like paracetamol and diclofenac for analgesia. So we are coming for induction of anesthesia. There is two ways we use for induction of anesthesia. Inhalational induction, which you, in the last 20 years, there is four issues that changed our behavior in the operating room. Number one, uh, sevoflurane. <clears throat> number two, fentanyl. Number three, laryngeal mask. And number four, remifentanyl. <coughs> and Rovol, sorry. So those four agents, it changed our behavior in the operating room. Uh, for example, inhalational induction, uh, it was with ether. Ether uh, is never good, and then moved to uh, hallucine. Hallucine was attractive for inhalational induction, uh, but it is highly toxic because it's very, very sensitive to the myocardium. It makes the patient bradycardia in no time. So now it is replaced widely, and the uh, universally by sevoflurane. Sevoflurane is an inhalational induction agent and the and the in, uh, inhalational agent, uh, anesthetic agent, and it changed our behavior in the anesthetic room completely now. Uh, uh, so inhalation induction could be an excellent for children that fear of the needle and uh, has difficult venous access. However, it is it needs another ex-skilled person with you uh, to do the IV line immediately after the patient to sleep. Correct size of the oropharyngeal airway may be required. And you choose one that the same length as uh, that from the corner of the mouth to the angle of the jaw. 
And that is the breathing circuit, which is the Jackson Reese uh, modification of the Mabelson uh, that suits a children. Uh, it is a very low resistance because it's open from here. It doesn't cause any problem with the child. The fresh gas flow coming from this way. So to the mask, we should have a filter here. And that one goes to the child. The child uh, exhale going here. And by the time goes here and can drain uh, air from the uh, from the uh, uh, environment. So the oxygen is continuously coming here. Oxygen is coming with inhalational agent to make the child uh, 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 sleep. And the, that that valve is open to prevent rebreathing and accumulation of carbon dioxide. And that is the environment here. The child is very happy and the nurse showing him his, to his toys and the, uh, uh, his mom is wearing the 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 PPE, and uh, just uh, the doctor is just waiting for him here, and uh, the nurse is sitting beside him, and uh, basically they are going to take him to the mask. Again, you see that's a simulation of the pediatric anesthesia, and uh, it is widely recognized training tools. The simulation now before passing those or before sitting to the uh, uh, program. IV induction. We have mainly around uh, two or three uh, agents for IV induction. Number one, ketamine. We we'll talked about that before <coughs> for uh, brain medication. Yeah. And uh, we have uh, sodium thibontone, which is interval. Uh, you know you, you know that very well in the uh, clinical practice. You always uh, give him intervala. Intervala means that sodium thibontone or intervala. Uh, Brovofol. Uh, Brovofol is not widely used in pediatric, especially in young age, especially if you give it Brovofol infusion. Because Brovofol is claimed for metabolic acidosis, hemodynamic instability, uh, hepatomegaly, rhabdomyolysis, and multiple organ failure, and uh, uh, hyperlipidemia, because propofol is mainly done from living. Uh, despite all of that, we're still using it uh, for children. We give them a small dose, once only is, is fine, uh, but we don't run it for infusion because there is a syndrome called green urine syndrome, and this is not good for children, especially metabolic acidosis. But ketamine is very safe, and interval is very safe as well, provided you give it strictly intravenous with appropriate dose. For IV induction, you have to have IV line. Basically, IV induction needs IV line. And usually in the back of the hand, the child comes with two imlacrim in both hands, uh, or the inner wrist, you have to know the anatomy now very well, where you can you get the uh, vein. A uh, lot of technology now coming to see, to show you the vein and uh, infrared and all this stuff. But basically, once you did the, the IV line, you have to fix it very well. Otherwise, you will lose it by any small movement of the children. Use elastoblast or anything like that, or wrap the vein very well to fix it. Uh, intravenous induction can be taken with Brovofol or Thibontone or Ketamine. You basically you need to do pre-oxygenation very well uh, for the children. And we know from the physiology, they have very small functional residual capacity. They can run to hypoxemia very quickly. It is nearly an hour now. Am I too long for you? It just nearly finished. So the intubation for the children, we did the induction. A straight megal blade, and we'll show it now, are useful in units and infants. It usually we start from size uh, zero, uh, the best for fair, four kg. Uh, for young age group, we use non cuffed tube. Uh, a small leak is very uh, important because uh, the lower uh, mean arterial blood pressure means that uh, you cannot uh, inflate the cuff and the mucosal uh, perfusion will be very low and those children <coughs> you compromise uh, the mucosal lining of the trachea. 
How to know uh, prepare? You know the reform I did before, I showed before. We put it like what you do exactly in the emergency department. You, uh, the ambulance call you, we have a child, uh, he's, uh, he's five years old, uh, what's his weight like? You put that in the, in the board and you start to calculate what, what tube are going to use that. Uh, the tube size here is age divided by four plus four by five. Usually, or age divided by four or plus four up to 10 years. Um, the tube length is very important. Uh, as we mentioned before, the trachea is very short. And if you push the tube far uh, in or take it out superficially, it's very dangerous. So you have to listen to bilaterally and you have to fix the tube at appropriate length. And this is the size of the tube here. And usually, when you intubate, you have to see the tip of that black side outside the vocal cord. So that black lens should be far beyond the vocal cord. And this type here is the tube. You see how small the tube in comparison to the other side of the tube. The, basically, <clears throat> the size of the tube is written outside uh, in one uh, figure, and the length of the tube is written on the other side. And again, that's type of cuffed, non cuffed tube. That's cuffed tube. Um, basically, if you have 5.5 non cuffed tube, it's equal to 5 cuffed tube. Why the size of the tube is very important? Because you know the flow of air is very uh, dependent on the diameter of the tube. So, another point of the uh, children because the uh, airway is narrow, so the resistance uh, to, to ventilate is high. So that's why you have to choose the appropriate size tube, not to underventilate your children, not to overventilate, not to make a high pressure on the mucosa. There's a lot of certain issues around that you have to put in your mind when you come to the ventilation. As we mentioned, uh, less than eight years old, we use non cuffed tube with a loud leak a little bit. Uh, above, um, above 10 years old, we use a cough tube. Uh, sometime, sometime uh, in emergency uh, situation like appendix or uh, septic abdomen or whatever, I use the cough tube, but I don't inflate the cough because the cough is, uh, uh, you know, like uh, 0.5 size in the tube. So the 5.5 non cough tube equal to 5 cough tube. And this is special type of the tube, which is called <coughs> preform tube or ray tube. That usually we use it in tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy, or a facial operation, or neuro operation. That is a tube, and you fix that to the, uh, uh, the tube. That's how to choose the uh, size of the tube. And this is the Miller or the laryngoscopy here. And this is the difference between Macintosh and the Miller laryngoscope. Miller laryngoscope are usually uh, uh, flat and uh, longer a little bit. And this one, Macintosh, is curved. Why that one is advantage in the children? Because as we mentioned before, the epiglottis is long and the funnel shape. So you need something to raise the epiglottis to avoid obstruction uh, uh, with the intubation. <coughs> Different issue with the with the uh, uh, general anesthetic. Uh, we sometimes we don't go with the tube. We go with the laryngeal mask, and we have here uh, different sizes of types of laryngeal mask and different sizes. Uh, this is the smallest size, size one, uh, around uh, four five kg, and uh, we inflate the uh, the cup of the laryngeal mask with four M, four mil. And we put that reformer in the wall in the operating room for teaching and for nursing uh, to know exactly how much you put in the laryngeal mass to avoid leak or to avoid over pressure uh, on the mucosa of the children. And this is a special type of laryngeal mass. It's called eye gel. I actually, I use it a lot in adult. Uh, I don't use it in the children much because it's very stiff and it is not popular in the children. However, it is used, but I go with the uh, conventional laryngeal mask in, uh, in the children. But for adult, I use this one a lot. <clears throat> As the same again, 
so maintenance of anesthesia, uh, usually between oxygen, air, nitrous oxide, some people are still using nitrous, and the volatile agent. Uh, for all for children, uh, younger children, less than uh, 10 years old, we don't give it as infusion, but we should be cautious as regards nausea and vomiting. We give them ondansetrol and dexamethasone. Uh, uh, operation usually require antibiotics. It's very important to check if the child is allergic to any antibiotics or that anybody of the family sometime. This is anesthetic for the children is the first time. So you should be uh, asking the family, do they have any uh, uh, allergic uh, reaction to any drugs or any, because sometimes those are genetics. Uh, very important here, uh, the fluid therapy, the goal of fluid therapy is number one, to replace the deficit. The child is fasting, his mom is very good and keeping the child fasting from nine o'clock last night and he is coming for operation around 10, or 10 in the morning or 12 in the, in the lunch time. So uh, almost 10 to 12 hour fasting, that child could be dehydrated. So you wanted to replace the deficit of the fluid. Uh, maintenance of the, of the fluid, the child needs around 40 mL if he is more than 10 kg, he needs 40 mL per hour, and the, there is a certain stress loss for uh, trauma for the surgery, it depends on the surgical operation itself, and if any bleeding need to replace the bleeding. Usually we start with a bolus of 10 mL per kg uh, as a bolus to replace uh, what the child deficit and uh, avoid glucose containing fluids unless the patient is hypoglycemia. <clears throat> uh, be cautious that operation needs analgesia and usually we use a multimodal analgesia. Pain management is very essential a uh, multimodal approach, you use local anesthetic in the wound, you use paracetamol and uh, or uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, uh, or ibuprofen <coughs> both operatively. You have to know the doses of those drugs very carefully. If you use opioid, it's not ideal because it results in both of the nausea and vomiting, but if, the, if you have to use it, you have to use it and uh, use the appropriate doses and uh, between intramuscular, intravenous and oral opioid. Uh, local anesthetic is magic. Uh, if you can use it, sometimes if the child is asleep, you can give them the epidural. Some people give the caudal analgesia. If the operation in the, uh, around the velvet, so they give them caudal block. Uh, nausea and vomiting, number one, hydration, number two, being control, number three, uh, different antiemetic like Zofran, uh, and on Dancitron or uh, Dexamethasone or Cyclizine. Uh, common most operative problem in pediatric, you have to be aware uh, during, uh, after anesthesia, especially like delirium is very important. After two weeks, the, ch the, the mom and dad come to you. I, I don't feel my child is the same since uh, he had um, the anesthetic. And uh, typically, yes, we, claim, we blame the anesthetist. He's the reason for that. And we don't know because um, they have lots of factors, not like the other. Uh, usually we have complication like what I told you about our airway obstruction today with me in the, in the morning and they, they have laryngus vas, most of the crops, uh, they have bronchus vas, uh, sometimes the vomit and aspiration. Take home message today from my lecture, please. Uh, pre assessment and preparation is extremely important for proper outcome. Treat the child with respect to his identity. Be empathetic and professional to the child. Be extremely punctual, calculate your doses accurately all drugs should be calculated very accurately it, it doesn't matter how big the child or how small sometimes you give a uh, 12 ml or 12 milligram of uh, whatever drug but you can't give 15 you have to go to 12. induction and the emergence of anesthesia are extremely important time and the most vulnerable time for complication uh, communicate properly and appropriately and timely manner with the nursing staff, with the dad and mom. If any problem happen, you have to brief the people uh, correspondent. You have to talk to them very professionally, to explain to them very honestly. It's beyond the scope of this lecture today, but you know, it's very important as well. 
And thank you very much again for inviting me to do this lecture. And I'm so proud to be uh, before you here. Thank you. Any question? Hello? Nobody here. Okay. Hello. What should I do now? <coughs> this is one hour and uh, 10 minutes. Anybody here? I have 23 people around, but I don't know. Dr. Randa? Um, I don't know what should I do. Uh, yes, there is a chat box again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lovna. Uh, thank you very much. What should I do now? What should I do now? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lovna. Uh, I hope I fulfill all points. Uh, I told you all the basic you know about, uh, you, you know that already, but it's very important uh, to, to, to know about the psychology of the children and uh, is not a, a simple anesthetic. Uh, simple surgery is not a simple anesthesia, okay? <clears throat>